It's therefore my great honor to introduce our speaker today, Professor Anthony Ping from the University of Melbourne, who is one of the leading scholar in translation studies. Anthony is probably best known for being one of the very first translation scholars to move the study of translation away from text and towards translation and other social agents as people. He has also conceptualized translation as a form of risk management to address real world problems. His recent work, to my knowledge, concerned high stake intercultural mediation, including behavior change, health communication from both the production and the reception side. Today, Anthony is going to talk to us about the problem solving as an approach to translation. This is a subject in which we should all be deeply interested, as we have so many colleagues and students from the local community, China, Europe, and Australia, and to join us today. We welcome all of you again. So Anthony, thanks um, again for agreeing to being our first speaker at NUS Translation Seminar in Singapore. The floor is yours. Thank you, Bay, and thank you, Professor Tam, and uh, thank you to everyone for being there, and especially all the good, healthy Chinese names. Uh, we're in that part of the world. This is our time zone. This is where we work. And good morning to the friends from Europe who have got up early at nine o'clock to be here. It's good to see you too. I am going to speak in a very general, non-technical way, um, oriented towards really the problems of Singapore, where Bay, who was my doctoral student in, and is now becoming famous as a translation scholar, um, is setting up a research group and introducing translation into a modern languages, literary, um, very prestigious uh, institution. And I'm interested in, in that process and in how translation studies as a discipline really compares with other possible disciplines uh, that are neighboring us. And my reflections uh, come from the end of a career. I, I'm at retirement age. I don't want to retire, but I'm up there. And I'm starting to look back and saying, well, how did I get here? And uh, I'll start with an anecdote, and there will be a few anecdotes along the way. Um, in 1985, I finished my doctorate, which was in uh, sociology technically, but the sociology of literature, and I wrote it in a department of comparative literature. So I'm not a translation person in that sense. I uh, successfully defended it. They, they all got up and applauded, as one does in, in France. And, um, and I walked out of there and I said, never again. That's it. Finish with universities. I do not want to get into a university ever again. And look how successful that's been, right? And why was that? I, I think I felt very strongly uh, that the studies I'd been doing were great for me and my personal development. My daughter it was a reflection on my own position in several cultures and languages. And um, it wasn't dealing with real world problems. And I wanted to do that. I needed more engagement. And I thought the university is not the place I'm going to get that. So one goes out into the world. And what does one do with, uh, with languages and a bit of cultural knowledge? Uh, I don't know. What did I do? Hey, I, I was a waiter. I was a taxi driver. I did mining work. But with languages, lots of English teaching, lots of work with publishers. Uh, in Spain, where I decided to settle. I worked for a cultural foundation. Uh, there, I organized conferences. We gave uh, residential grants to writers and to painters. Uh, and amidst all that promotional language, cultural work that one can do outside of the university, yeah, I started translating. Well, started. I'd already done one book prior to that, but I started translating professionally which means for money. Uh, so I finished up, let's see, in the following 10 years, I'd worked for the president of Catalonia. I'd worked on the Barcelona Olympic Games. I had been interpreting at medical conferences and art history conferences, which were great. I enjoy in conference interpreting. I'm not very good at it, but I enjoy it. And I'd done lots and lots of, uh, of books 
of uh, <laughs> books for publishing, like, you know, encyclopedias for kids, children's books, little, little children's books, you know, the daytime, the nighttime, things like that. Uh, and then little by little, I got back into the university. How did that happen? Well, uh, I, I was offered a job teaching English and then taking a few translation classes. And I found for, for quite a few years in my career that I could balance the two very happily. Uh, I could be doing professional translation and go into a class and talk about my problems with the students and help the students solve problems of the kind they were really going to face. And I enjoyed that period very much where I was sort of 50 or 50, but the pressure of things is such that the teaching responsibilities became greater. Uh, what happened is I burnt out. I, I, I translated too much with days of little Mac computers and uh, my eyesight was very problematic. And so I uh, actually went to the Canary Islands and there I started to have a bit more academic work than, than translation work. Now, looking back at that period, which might be 25 years or so, I, um, I think that was very good. It was very good for me uh, as an academic, if you like, to be engaged in a community of practice. And if I look back now, I did this, I did this a few weeks ago. The university here in Melbourne wanted to put all my previous publications in their database. And I, you know, what for? I don't care about that. So I sat down for a couple of days and I put them all in. I just dug them up, all the things, put them all in. And I got to, let's see, 330 scholarly works. And then I'm looking at these 330 things. I think, you know, in, in academic terms, this would be a load of rubbish. Not all of it. I mean, there are the Oxford Cambridge things and lots of Routledge things and Benjamin's things, but I've done a lot of, of actual publishing in uh, newsletters, industry broadsheets, uh, websites, blogs, um, things that are there for the community of practice, for translators and interpreters. And, uh, and I think that's been good. Uh, for me, that's been a very good kind of career to have a few serious publications, but a lot of work that's really in dialogue with practitioners. I have enjoyed that very much. It was necessary for me. And that's how I resolved that, that thing I said back when I got the doctorate, never again. I said, well, wait a minute. All right. Yes, we can do a little bit of this if we can engage in both camps at the same time. All right. I think I've done, I've been happy doing that more than it would have been if I'd stuck in literary studies, where if you think about it, there is a certain community of practice in the, in the writers and publishers and readers, but you're not directly involved. There, there is a bigger hiatus, uh, which I'll come back to later. Certainly sociology, if you're doing sociology, your community of practice is the sociologists and not the societies. And my early studies were in history where you're even by definition uh, separated from the community of practice that you're working on. So I um, selected a field or the field selected me precisely because I could get that degree of involvement and engagement. It, it provided uh, an inner emotional drive uh, to identify with a group of people, to defend them, because the more you work on translators and interpreters, especially in the historical uh, perspective, the more you're aware that they are the secret agents of change, that their stories are not told, uh, that they are excluded from the standard literary histories, for example, and that there's a whole nother side to tell, and that academics can do that and could hope to help the profession in that by providing visibility, as we say, and uh, I hope a, a greater sense of, of, of identity in, and a social role in, in improving the lot of our societies. In my early work, I was very dedicated 
dedicated, ideologically given to helping and improving the lot of professional translators and interpreters. I admit that was particularly in Europe, and I was also enthusiastic about uh, European unification, which went hand in hand uh, with that. Uh, my ide ideologies have changed over the years. I'm now in Australia, we have an entirely different, uh, different uh, set of problems to work on. Now, I think I'm not alone in that. Um, a while back, Esther Torres and I did a survey of 350 translation scholars, and we found that 96% of them had translated or interpreted on a regular basis without specifying what, what that means. But, but the level is very high. If you look at uh, the ruck of academic disciplines, this would be a place where many of us have uh, experience of what we're teaching or what we're talking about, experience on the non-academic side. And I think that is a good thing. Although if you read our report, you'll find that the reasons are not always altruistic. They have to do with inadequate uh, career development in academia or underpay and the obligation to have a second or third source of income. So it's not all happy, I must admit. From that perspective then, I'm not going to argue that problem solving in translation studies is necessarily different uh, from uh, science, if you like, or the humanities. I'm not, I'm interested in, in that overlap, but I'm not going to fall into what I see as the trap of opposing humanities and science as two different ways of solving problems. Um, I will be arguing that translators and interpreters as pr practitioners solve problems and that scholars who are also practitioners also solve problems and can help each other solve problems. That's the ideal uh, menu that I will be pushing forward here. But I'm not going to argue, for example, that it's a question of exact knowledge versus fuzzy knowledge, experimental versus observational, mechanical solutions versus creative solutions, um, those kinds of oppositions misunderstand the nature of contemporary science, I think, which is itself highly creative, um, very probabilistic, does use complexity and fuzzy uh, logic, um, far more and far better than most of us do in humanities. And uh, methodologically, in my own work, I think we should uh, absorb all those things and not presume to have our, our special mode of solving problems because, hey, we're in the humanities and so we don't care about exact science. Uh, that's not the argument that I'm pushing here. My concern is that relation between academic work and the community of practice. And in, in science, there is just, just a, a different kind of community of practice, if you like, uh, which is in some areas more shielded uh, from the non-academic community. This is where I'm going to try to share a slide if I'm lucky. Let's see if that works. Yep. I've only got three slides I want to show you. I'm trying to get away from PowerPoint, folks. <laughs> Perhaps in vain. Now, um, I've got, I'm not going to go into philosophy, uh, but this is my man for what I'm talking about, for what it's worth, okay? Uh, Louis Altus, uh, whom I read very early on prior to, um, yeah, certainly prior to my doctoral studies. And it was one of these books you pick up, it was four marks, pour marks in French, and, and you say, well, at last somebody's thinking about the problems that I'm facing and is helping me find answers. And that's been incredibly influential over the years. Uh, he was a French uh, a Marxist leninist, a, a theorist, a philosopher. He's also famous for murdering his wife and spent most of his life in psychiatric institutions. <laughs> so I'm not gonna say he's the greatest man that have ever lived. But a lot of Althusser's thought is about the way a, a Marxist theorist relates to the people who are acting in history for the Marxists, the, the proletariat, the workers, all right? And uh, Althusser's uh, entry into this problem in his epistemology 
is that problems are never solved in theory. They are solved in historical practice. The, the solutions that are found are always found in practice. Uh, and that means in people doing things in the world, certainly not in the academic world of ideas and language alone. And yet he allows that the practitioners, the people who are doing things in the streets and at work in the workplace and their unions, et cetera, moving history forward uh, within that ideology, they also theorize. So there was never a question for Althusser of say, theory here, practice there, and these are two different things. There is theorization within practice, and there is theorization within, within intellectual practice uh, uh, on the part of what's called the big T theory on, on what we would say uh, is an academia, okay? And um, the difference is that the practitioners are, have a, their theorizing welded to practice, and is guided by outcomes, whereas the more reflexive theorists, big T in this case, um, formalize alternatives by working on language and can help or not. Uh, so in some of uh, Althusser's study of this problem, uh, for example, he has a lot to say about the fact that in the 19th century, all the theorists uh, big T theorist of, of you know, the, the communist movement, et cetera, uh, theorized that the, the proletarian revolution should happen in the countries of advanced capitalism. Uh, that would be uh, Britain or Germany. So that's where you wanted it to happen. It didn't, they got it entirely wrong. It happened in Russia. And, and there was a new theory, the theory of the weakest link and, 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 and the practice forced a rethinking of, of, of all the prior theory. So the theorists can get it wrong and practitioners by definition are the only people who can get it right because solutions are found in practice. On the other hand, uh, in Althusser's readings of Marx's develop, Karl Marx's development as a thinker, he, he makes a lot, too much I think, but uh, about uh, the cleaning up of language uh, so that one could understand how capitalism was working. And the great epistemological break for Althusser was the concept of surplus value, uh, Mervet, uh, which put together a, a string of previously isolated concepts and it made it uh, abundantly clear that uh, capitalism worked by accumulating surplus value, to simplify. And that this would be a case where the big T work on, on ideas and language helps advance the practitioners out in the field. So um, <laughs> I'm on the side of the academics here, right? I'm, I'm the guy who identifies with Karl Marx secretly, all right? And um, we can get it terribly wrong, obviously, but in some cases we can do work on language and on concepts that can help move history forward. Now, my ideal uh, happy association with the community of practitioners has not lasted or was never entirely happy. Uh, things fall apart. Uh, this is me, this is just an example, but I mean, there are many examples throughout, throughout my career of, um, of misunderstandings and backlash and resentment and, and generally bad relations between academics and professional translators and interpreters. So Bay will realize she took this photo uh, at the uh, uh, International Translators Federation in Brisbane, 2017. I'm up there speaking. It's on disruption and diverse diversification. So there's some diversification there and I'm obviously not connecting with the audience because this down here is my son playing on his phone, paying no attention whatsoever. So I've lost communication there. But, but I don't know if you've got that experience, but when you're up there speaking to a group of people, unlike what I'm doing now, you know what they're thinking. So I'm aware as I speak, this, this guy up the back there on the left, oldish guy, he's Australian, I can tell from the way he's dressing, he is really pissed off with me after about 10 minutes. 
and, and, and I know what he's going to say. I know that he's a translator and I know he's against academics because academics know nothing about the profession. And sure enough, right on cue, he gets up and asks a question, which is something like, well, translation is just a matter of being accurate, isn't it? And I say, yes, that's right. Thank you very much. And that's it. You know, then there is this view within the community that uh, the academic is an intruder, an imposter, somebody who doesn't really know the trade and by definition hasn't really done it. Uh, this goes back to Bernard Shaw's uh, quip about teachers, you know, those who can do and those who can't teach. Was it then Peter Newmark who said, those that can write, write, those that can't write, translate, and those that can't translate, teach translation. <laughs> We're the worst of the worst. We know nothing about it. And then uh, up on the right at the back, I know there's a series of, of, of women there whom I identify one or two, but, but I, I discovered afterwards they're sending messages to each other as I'm speaking about He's really gone off the rails. I really thought he would be talking about our real problems. Oh, look, yet another bloody academic. Uh, and, and sure enough, right on cue, one of them comes up and, and says, um, everything you're saying, we know already. You know, um, you know it's Chris Durbin. She was saying, oh, no, uh, prestige translators, the prestige sector knows this already. I said, well, yeah, for, this was Althusser. It's solved in practice. Of course, you know it. And my reply was, yes, and I look forward to doing research on it. That is, the, the solutions you found in practice, I can do research on and turn it into a different kind of knowledge that might or might not be of assistance. But I'm not at all upset or surprised that the things I'm talking about here have already been found in practice by some people, perhaps not by other people. And I can pick those, those solutions to problems up give them a format and make them more widely known across the profession and hopefully beyond. Um, yeah, so there we go. That's what I wanted to say about that. And we can move on. I mean, I'm not upset by that sort of response. It's got worse. I was at Monterey for, for a couple of years, eight years. And uh, there, the practitioners are the teachers, and they're excellent practitioners, especially conference interpreting, but also literary and, and spy interpreting. And um, they had solved it so that they didn't need publications in order to go up in the academic ranks. So this was a practice-based community, and they, they've done that. And then one guy, a real asshole, turns around and he says, well, what do we do with Anthony? You know, like the assumption that Anthony doesn't know anything about translation. Anthony's this bloody theorist. We can get rid of him right now. And that's okay, so I've, I've left soon after. But, 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 you know, there is real resentment and animosity out there. Uh, so this idealized community of practice hasn't really worked across the board. Now, I get it because I made that same complaint when I walked out after doing the doctorate. I understand that feeling. And I'm ashamed to say I still agree with it. And I want to claim or present as a hypothesis that I invite people out there to contradict, to disprove. I want to claim that translation studies as an academic discipline has solved no important problems of the kind that are facing Practitioners, pure practitioners who don't have an academic uh, academic training. Okay, or, uh, I will propose that the technologies which have been the drivers of change in this profession have not come from translation scholars at all. They come from AI and more recently mathematics. I want to propose that cognitive studies which has now its summer school and its journal and a, and a, a growing, um, uh, it's becoming a growing focus of intellectual and, and conceptual development has not solved any problem, has not discovered anything that is not already obvious to anybody or, or that goes beyond common sense. And I would like people to disprove that. I wait for it. Complexity studies is finding nothing but complexity. Corpus studies, never had any interesting problems to solve. They had to borrow some interesting problems which were purely academic. 
that has not helped practice at all. And there's a whole ruck of, of workplace studies and narrative studies that do come close to the profession, but remain incredibly naively descriptive and do not identify or solve any problems of real interest or concern to professionals. Uh, so yes, I get it. And I would not claim myself to have done very much to advance uh, work or the solving of real problems. And um, others who are close to the cause of translators and interpreters um, are often also activists who do very fine work, but the problems they address tend to come from outside the field of translation and interpreting, and therefore, by definition, do not address problems that are of concern to the, the, the community of practice uh, that, that we have. I think the problem, as I said, is that we went through a descriptive stage, Gideon Turi, Descriptive Translation Studies, and we have not come out of it enough. Uh, parts of it has, there's been lots of conceptual work, but we have uh, lost, lost the need to identify initial problems within the community of practice. And there's an increasing tendency to work on problems that are within the academic communities, the big T theorists, if you like, uh, without looking out beyond. This is my last slide then. Now, on the question of problem solving, uh, I have no, nothing fancy to offer you. There's no great theory here. Uh, and I've, I've pushed problem solving from the beginning because that was my problem at the beginning, wasn't it? I wasn't happy. Um, what's a problem? Okay, a, a situation requiring a choice and the choices are not going to be mechanical or automatic. So there has to be the intervention of, of, uh, of some conceptual work of some kind or predictive work, um, small t theorization in the Althusserian sense. And uh, very early on, I formulated that as a model of, um, of what is specific to translation and interpreting in my view. Okay, a very minimalist model. What do translators and interpreters do? They recognize a problem that concerns a start text or source text, I don't care which, an ST. They generate different ways of rendering that in another language or variety. And then from that series, they quickly and ethically select a TT, a translated text or a target text uh, with confidence, if not accuracy, with confidence at least. Okay. Uh, and that is a model of, of problem solving. Uh, so from the beginning, I've placed problem solving in my view of what translation skills are in their most essentially translational, okay, which is a problem. I'll come back to that essentialism later. Um, the problem solving can also move on to other higher level problems. That, that's one that you do on the fly, right? Uh, when you've got uh, somebody saying, uh, how do I choose this? And they're asking you as a teacher or a theorist or an academic or whatever. Uh, and I come back as the whole Scopos theory did with another question, why translate? Uh, basic functionalist proposal. There is some conceptual work going on. Question is asked, how do I know which one to choose? Every student will ask this, teacher, theorist, whatever says, well, ask yourself what the translation is for. And if you can answer that question, you'll be able to make this choice. Okay, that's fine. And then another solution, uh, one that interests me more these days, still thinking about um, how problems are solved. Another solution is, well, think about the stakes that are riding on this problem you have to solve. If it's important and has consequences for the rest of the text or relations with the clients or readership or whatever, uh, then it's high stakes and you should invest high effort in it. And if it's not, if it doesn't, if it has minimal consequences, then you invest less effort in it. And you're starting to give some guidance 
to this practice of solving problems. And uh, you can get these and develop the concepts that are involved in functionalism, for Scopus theory, risk management theory, or cooperation theory, for some of the work that I've been doing. And uh, start cleaning up some concepts that can be really quite simple uh, responses to real world problems that may or may not help. Uh, we hope that in practice, some people do find that they do help. But the solution will not be in, oh, let's get these concepts or these three kinds of risk management. And if you understand them, all your translation problems will be solved. Obviously not. It's saying, look, think about this, think about it, think about this, answer that question, this question, this question. Off you go and see if you can find your solution in practice. Because as Althusser said, the solutions are always found in practice. Now that's uh, my attempt to overcome or address the friction between the um, between the community of practitioners and, and the academy, the, the, the special friction that we have uh, in this field. Now I'm going to stop share there because I don't want to be led by by the PowerPoint. Oh, I could have shown you that. Okay, now I, I was thinking about that uh, in a class that I was teaching uh, not very long ago, and it's on a medical translation. I, I do teach actual, I do train translators. And uh, we were going through this text and uh, discussing the problems that the students could not solve in their groups. And uh, so one of them, for example, was, was terminology in, in um, epidemiology. Uh, uh, incidencia in Spanish is incidence or prevalence, you know, and, uh, uh, and all the terminology, you can point to the way it's solved and say, look, figure out the authority, it's power, figure out in this field, where does the power lie? What is the authority? Go to the authority, the one that regulates this text and use it. If you want to question it, you're questioning it, but be aware that you're questioning a particular authority. That's the way the medical field is structured. And then a whole other set of problems uh, concern typically syntax. Uh, we had the use of phrases like recent decades have seen or little has been published, the, the, the passives, uh, pseudo passives used here as well. Uh, and, and the recommendation is quite obvious and obviously different. You could say, well, what feels natural to you in English or look around and do some corpus work or Google, etc., and see what is, is most common in English. And as Doug Robinson would say, you translate with how good it feels, you translate with your gut. Uh, and uh, you get these, you know, we're helping people to solve problems in the teaching situation here uh, by referring to really quite big theories but they don't have to be presented as big theories. They can be simple dialogues that one has in order to point towards a solution. In no case here uh, has the theorist teacher authority in, in the classroom given the solution. Uh, the solution is in practice. The role of the academic here is to point to things to consider in order to lead to a solution which is found by the practitioner. Now, so much for problem solving. Um, I have some publications on that and there are higher levels of problem solving that I'll come to. But let me address first some of the criticisms that have been made of this problem solving approach. Uh, criticism, the most common one, one that's out there in a paper by Daniel Gill that I started replying to and said, well, well, why bother, really? I don't, it doesn't make, no. Uh, the criticism is, yes, but it doesn't describe everything that translators do or interpreters in that case. Yeah, of course. What do you think when I do my little formula that describes everything that translators do or interpreters? Not at all. My work in that particular field has never been to provide an exhaustive description of what anybody does by doing anything. Why would anybody want to do that? 
why would you set out to describe everything that, that a translator or interpreter does on the job or every problem encountered in the first chapter of Ulysses or every translation study that comes up in that in-flight magazine, sorry, translation strategy that comes up in an in-flight magazine that Andrew Chesterman comments on at one stage. I have never understood why one should try to just describe everything that's in the object of knowledge. But that was getting into his descriptive premise, you know, the, the principle of no leftovers uh, would be the, the part of that. Boring. Those, who's going to read that stuff? Of course they do this. Of course they spend their time doing this. An early paper on translation as, as constraints. This all, you know, translation is just a, 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 a text production activity uh, subject to constraints. And there's this whole series of constraints. Yeah, so what? Where does that solve a problem? Where can any practitioner come in here and say, well, thank you, you've pointed the way towards solving the solution. No, because you haven't even tried to identify a problem. Uh, the only problem is, oh, can we fit everything into our model? Um, I think that has been one of the main factors um, restraining the development of translation studies as a discipline in contact with its community of practice. Um, a, a second um, kind of critique, I noticed Sandra Halverson is there up early morning in, in Norway somewhere, uh, is... Um, it's rationalist that the whole um, project management uh, theorization uh, presupposes a rational egoist, which it does indeed. And that what I just said about uh, translators working hard where it counts and not working hard where it doesn't count, that this is optimization. And some psychologist has looked at humanity from out his back door peered into their soul and said, people do not optimize. Hey, I know that. People are stupid. I know that. People don't, uh, <laughs> don't make rational decisions. Of course they don't make, make rational decisions. That's why they're in front of me. That's why they're in my class. So that we can teach them something that they don't do already. So that we can give them ideas about how to perform better or point towards solutions to the problems that they can locate. Um, the goal of problem solving is not to describe everything and certainly not to make presuppositions about the human mind. Uh, that kind of problem is too big for us. You know, <laughs> we are not going to pit uh, your favorite philosopher who might be so against my favorite philosopher is not actually Althusser, but, but Lukács, you know, who wrote the ontology of social being. And I will argue about the rationality of work as a transformation of nature forever and ever because I like that stuff, but it's not nothing to do with the problems we are working on here related to the practice of translation and interpreting. The Third critique that has come up occasionally is one of instrumentalization, that there should be no constraints on free academic work uh, because we should have a free inquiry and not be subject to, to whoever's paying for our research or whatever state program uh, we, we might be working within. And I am sensitive to that critique and my response to it is what I'm going to come into now, that instrumentalization is always present because we are always historically situated. We're always um, negotiating for money and for academic prestige, and that we have to recognize that and, and ref reflect on it, but not be too close to practice. And that's this is the, 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 the trick, uh, that there are degrees of abstraction and sometimes the degree of abstraction can be a good thing. I will explain this through examples. Here, are, there are some questions that academic research is not good for. Here's one. 
uh, a translation company down the road asks me, is it worth buying Trados? Well, I can give an opinion. Any translator can give an opinion. Anybody who's worked with the translation memory suites could say yes or no, or consider this. You can go online and find blogs and things. But, but look, for me to do research on that question, it's going to take me a year to set it up, a year to do research, and two years to get published. And in four years' time, you know what? Trados will not be the same, and the rival translation memories will not be the same, and there'll probably be a new avatar of machine translation out there. So that is not the kind of question that I can work on. It's too close to the industry. It, industry does it very well. The practitioners do that very well. They don't need academics for that unless it's just to you know, suggest the obvious, um, consider the size of your company and the kinds of text and the degree of repetitions, but, uh, but that does not require uh, enormous work. And it's not something that you require academic work for. So let practitioners handle those problems because the time frame is too short. We work on problems that have a slightly bigger time frame. Here's another problem. Um, I'm working on technology, as you can see. Is post-editing as good as fully human in a translation? And this is a real question. Uh, it came out in a Spanish field with respect to Squid Game that you might have heard of, where uh, activists within the profession of subtitles in Spain denounce Netflix's use of post-editing. And they use the term post-editing as if it meant raw machine translation, interestingly, from the English version and not from the Korean, but that's another point. And um, make the assumption that post-editing will never be as good as fully human translation. Now, that's something worth doing research on, uh, but you can't do it immediately. Why? Because the main variable is who's doing the post-editing, what training have they had, how long have they had to develop a, a habitus and a positive self-image while they're doing it. And so you need more time or you have to select your subjects very carefully in order to set up some kind of experiment where we could answer this question. Uh, we might have an answer for you in two to five years, but we could get an answer, sure. And we could start to work on that kind of problem. Or we might give you factors to think about uh, that might have some grounding in variables that are not immediately obvious to the activists in the field who want to uh, maintain fully human translation for all subtitling. Good luck with that. History is against you, as is technology. Another question. How should translators work with neural machine translation? Now, neural has been around since 2016. That's five and a bit years, five years more or less. Uh, we are starting to get data and we can get a lot of data on what happened before or what happens after or who's good at it, who's not. And uh, it may not be limited to post-editing. It may be pre-editing as well. That kind of question, which is uh, um, concerning a, a technology that has a longer time span with its avatars, I must admit, we can start to work on and have something to say. In fact, I published a paper with Esther Torres again, uh, discussing this problem, but looking at data, for example, on where the profits are being made in the translation industry, and it's very clear that the bigger the company, the bigger the profits, the bigger the company, the more technology they're using. So you know what? It could be that the technology is working to the benefit of the big companies. And let's investigate further on that score. And the smaller uh, one or two or three uh, employee companies are losing out in the uh, profit profitability stakes and, and have uh, usually uh, rather less technology. So there's a lot to be discovered there, and it's worth discovering because it's a bigger time frame. Uh, academics can get more reliable data on it, and we can map tendencies, and we can have something to say 
that, God help me, should be of extreme importance to any practitioner in the field. Now, the question, should translators work with uh, neural machine translation, uh, can be cleaned up. In the, in the same way, as I said, that translators facing a problem generate alternatives, then select. We can, in this big T theoretical discourse, say, right, there you are, translators, there you have neural machine translation, its quality is improving, what are we going to do? Option one, become post editors. Uh, and this is a very strong industry discourse. In fact, I give my students a video produced by SDL, uh, it has now been taken over, but SDL produced it, describing the new post-editing certification that they offer and how it's the way forward. And I did publish a paper uh, describing the, the skills required for working in post-editing with, with machine translation. But there is at least one alternative, a major one, provide additional services do something that the machine translation can't do. Uh, and we do find that operating out in industry. Uh, one of the companies here in Melbourne, for example, uh, does use technology. Not all of them do, that's another problem. Uh, but specializes in uh, citizenship applications, for example, and has specialized knowledge and specialized legal knowledge. And, and that works very well as well. Uh, they can successfully work with machine translation because they're offering additional services. And uh, so we can get these options and map them out and present that to people and say, if you go down this path, it's going to happen. If you're a big company, go into the technology and just provide translation services, probably within one particular vertical or another. Uh, if you're smaller, look into providing additional services or, and this is what we find happening in the field, and it's the last part of the article that we had there, look at the different names that are being used for translators. Uh, that the translator as a mediator is being called uh, numerous different things. Uh, if they're working with technology, they can be called solutions architects, for example. Uh, they can, you know, Translators who, who work in journalism and translators who work in audiovisual translation. There are all these different names uh, out there which will tell you that uh, the industry itself is finding solutions to that very practical problem. Technology improves, we diversify our services. It's a logical thing. A researcher can point to it happening, but the people on the ground have found those solutions. Now, and it's a long-term process. Now, I come back to that talk I gave where the translators hated what I was saying. And I was, I was not though, some translators, okay. Uh, my talk was called, uh, Translators Do More Than Translate. And I was trying to talk about precisely this, and I was going back in history and showing that in the history of, of, of interlingual mediation, which is what we do, the advent of the person who only translates, the nur ubesetzer, yeah, the only translator, is a very recent phenomenon. Uh, basically, you know, since the 30s and 40s. Uh, prior to that, it was quite normal for translators to be doing other communication activities. Uh, and, and I was trying to present that to people is a way of saying this, look, look at your identity. Your identity has always been more than the translation, more than the interpreter. The identity historically has been to have diversified communication activities. Okay, it didn't get across. It was also in the, in the, in the um, context of the Australian code of ethics, which I was talking about the AUSIT code of ethics, which is very big on role boundaries because it's, it's designed for court and for medical situations where it wants to limit the role of the translator and the interpreter to only translation and interpreting. But we have other factors there coming through with, with technology that, that are forcing people to do other stuff. And I wanted to point out the inadequacy of that code of ethics and it's time to rethink 
uh, what you're doing there. So when uh, Chris Durbin came and said, practitioners uh, know this already, of course you do, of course you do, you do, but the others don't. The others who are sitting in front of you, the people with the code of ethics don't. The Feder International Translators Federation doesn't because of that identity there, that, 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 that professional identity, which is invested in, in the very name. Um, so I, I think that the work I was trying to do was well-intentioned. Did it fail? I admit it failed. Uh, the communication was not as good as it could be. But if we look back on it in a few years, somebody might find, hey, you know what? There were elements there that might provide some clues as to how to solve this historical problem. The work of the academic in this field is very practical in the training. And I'm so happy to have been able to train people who can go out into the world and make a difference, as they say. That's been great. But the more intellectual work requires even more abstraction, and that means even wider time frames for the problems we work on. And I think this is not always appreciated. Um, some of the problems become internal to a discipline. Uh, for example, uh, when descriptive translation studies was going in the 70s and 80s, and as Gideon Turi observed was producing isolated descriptions that didn't go anywhere, uh, the concept of norms came in and organized that into something that people could hope to discover and compare. And the concept was incredibly successful. There were a whole lot of master theses and doctoral theses whose aim was to discover norms. Uh, similar things have happened with the concept of habitus. And these concepts, is this, this theoretical work, and this is really theory, is functional historically within the, the, the discipline for holding it together as a discipline and pointing the way forward. When that historical work is done, then you move on to the next internal problem within the discipline. And, and you move forward with that. This might be the case of complexity now within translation studies, which has a certain prevalence and does give a certain language that some people could talk about. Unfortunately, it doesn't solve problems in the community of practice, but that's another concern. The problem that engaged me for perhaps most of my academic career, such as it is, has been uh, the, the contradiction between the theories of equivalence, the notions of equivalence and the practice of equivalence that was established when I walked into this field by people other than myself and, and my concern with indeterminacy, my concern with the hermeneutic tradition that everything in that text has to be interpreted and I will interpret it differently from you or another. And so uh, the indeterminacy undermines that equivalence. And now that is a big problem that uh, has been with us really from the early modern period, because equivalence as a practice uh, dates, dates from Renaissance Italy, of the printing press, in fact. And academic historical work can, can pick that up and say, well, you know, where did it come from? I say, you know, the printing press. Uh, it became big when uh, the European Union and Canada needed multilingual governance. Uh, you needed your laws to have legal equivalents. And it came also from Eugene Nida and the uh, evangelical presumption of the same spirit operating in different texts. Therefore, there's some equivalence there on, on a dynamic level. And those things come together and form um, a, a certain agreement uh, within uh, the Western discipline uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, okay? And you can describe that. But then the problem is how to think, how to go beyond that. How is it possible that communication between languages can function and be trusted in the absence or when we are aware that equivalence is no longer a, a yardstick, that people no longer believe in it? that people are 
uh, able to locate alternatives to any rendition very, very quickly, thanks to electronic communication, for example. And it's there that, that one does pure theoretical work, like Marx with Mehrwert, with that surplus value, where he's going through the other economists' text and making copious notes. It's good, called the Grundwisse, it, um, Grundrisse. It's, it's, it's all his notes as he's trying to think about capitalism. It is very hard to work with concepts when you don't have the solution to the problem. You can, it, it, it's a pure intellectual problem. How do we communicate and be trusted without equivalence? And, and it's there that I've invested most of my work in cooperation theory and risk management, and more recently trust, uh, work on the concept of trust. It's abstract. Yes, it's abstract because these are big problems on the level of centuries. Is there a community of practice over the centuries? Yes. But one has to rely, I think, on the, the hope that work on that level will eventually have some positive effect uh, on a community of practice. And even there, if there is a solution, it will always be in practice. I would love to be able to formulate a new way of translating that will solve all the problems uh, confronting uh, community of practice now. It's not going to happen. I'm not able to do that, but I just hope I can get together a few elements that might point in the direction. So my academic work, I must admit, many of it, the more abstract stuff, the more conceptual stuff. Yeah, and I wrote a book on translation theories, God help us, yeah, so I'm really there. It's a long way, but it's not the instrumental. The instrumentalization comes from being too close to, you know, hey, Trados gives me free licenses, so I'm going to say Trados is really good. Yeah, that's instrumentalization. But thinking about how can we communicate without the equivalence belief being operative, oh, that's a lot of work. And that's not instrumentalization. And it's ongoing and it's going to be done by communities of people thinking um, on, on, on the conceptual level, not just on the, the practical level. My inner feeling of having had a useless academic career has reversed thanks to COVID-19. If ever there were real world problems that come out and hit you in the face, it has been uh, in trying to deal with the consequences of a pandemic in a, an extremely super diverse, multilingual, multicultural city like Melbourne, where official communication has to reach people in many, many, many languages, uh, work, uh, some documents can be going to 85 languages, many of them into 60 or so languages, others into 30 or so languages. But translation has been one of the main factors involved in this community where I'm living now in, um, in coordinating actions against the pandemic, in achieving pure cooperation, cooperative activity. Uh, there have been few cases uh, that have required uh, such um, uh, the idea of cooperation that if I wear a mask, for example, which I have here, it's a benefit for me and you. And if I take my, my rat, which I have here, and I've got that knowledge about the state of my health, it's a benefit to me and to you, to both of us. There are mutual benefits. Now, translation failed in the early part of, well, in mid 2020, uh, it's a huge operation, logistically very, very difficult. And we had frontline examples like uh, uh, documents that mix up the two, two languages, like Turkish and Farsi, because they look like Arabic script, they are, uh, but they're on the same documents. And, you know, it's just embarrassing. The people in those communities get the idea that you don't care about their language, they lose trust in official communication and don't get vaccinated, for example. And that's been a real problem. And I'm so pleased that uh, not only some of the commentary I've made, but also a lot of the research that I've been doing in the past two years 
has been to work on absolute clear problems that concern translation. Problem number one, how to reduce vaccination hesitancy in um, cult communities, culturally and linguistically diverse communities, right? In the many non-English language communities that we have around us. Okay, that's a problem. Solution number one, provide good translations and get them checked because there were bad translations, uh, there were some serious mistakes made and there were bad uh, workflow management uh, problems uh, occurring as well. So solution one, good translations. And then the problem became that the, the good translation was too slow. Uh, there are cases where uh, the, in some languages, the information was not updated in eight weeks. In eight weeks, that, that's two variants of COVID, you know, that's, that's just a whole new show. Uh, so, so pure quality was not going to work. It was obvious that time was of the essence there in the, uh, in the production of the translations. And then uh, solution number two has increasingly become here in Melbourne, particularly, uh, not using official translations, uh, but using community members uh, in the many community organizations that exist, um, using them as mediators, not to translate a text, but to understand a text and convey it in the medium and the language most appropriate to the end users, the people who have to be convinced that they should get vaccinated or test themselves. Okay. Now, of those two solutions, this is the trick. Okay, uh, I, 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 you, we do research on this. We look at it, we get the data, we interview all these people. We don't believe everything they tell us. because, But nevertheless, uh, the numbers of vaccination and, the, and where it happens in the city showed that the policy shift away from official translations to community mediation and the development of trust through local networks and religious organizations increased vaccination in those parts of the city radically, from the least vaccinated to the most. Uh, that there was, in practice, a solution to the problem, but the solution was formulated by academics discussing with policy people. And um, we found a solution. No, they found a solution on the ground. They found a solution on the ground. Research can help solve these problems. And now the, there's very, very real problems there. When we have information to get out, how do you decide which language to give priority to? How do you determine which medium should be used? And we've been getting reception information on that to help uh, the, the, the government of Victoria solve those problems. And next week, I'll be there speaking to the committee that's in charge of policy on translation and, and healthcare uh, in, in, in Victoria. And I'm so pleased that, I'm not pleased that there's a pandemic, but I am pleased that I have been able to contribute in some small way to finding real world solutions to communication problems. The catch though, the catch though, as, as I'm sure you see, is that in this case, the solution concerns more than translators and interpreters. It's not by any means the community of practice that I strove to support. And in fact, in some of the uh, conferences I see in chat sessions and things, the professional translators are very upset that a lot of money and it, attention is going to essentially unqualified mediators, which is an affront to professionalism. Okay, but it's the solution on the ground. Uh, that is, I have increasingly become used to, to the position that I don't know, I, I'm no longer associated with that community of practice, which calls itself professional translators and interpreters. I mean, I, I used to work to benefit their directly, okay, ideologically, to benefit their pay and their prestige and their visibility, uh, their use of technologies, uh, the professionalism, 
uh, that they have and, and to produce new generations of very good professionals. That motivated me for a very, very long time. But I'm increasingly seeing that um, thanks in part to, to the technologies, which enables everybody to have a gist of a text, but also to the nature of the new problems that we are facing, that my work doesn't have to be on translation and interpreting. It has to be on multilingual communication. It has to be on the policies that are at work in order to get a multicultural city to function cooperatively. Uh, and that's a big mission. That's pointing down the road. That's pointing to the future. I think that is the area in which we really have serious problems. All big cities are multilingual and, and, and uh, multicultural these days. All big cities face inequalities and tension between different language groups and cultural groups. All big cities could benefit from communication strategies that can enhance cooperation and trust. Those are the problems that motivate me now. I'm not gonna retire. I'm really not gonna retire. I've got too much work I want to do in the next few years. And it's very clear to me that that means working with more than translators. Translators have always done more than translation, but I think as a scholar, it's very clear to me now that the problems to work on are far wider than those of a narrow or the narrow community of practice with which I originally identified. I thank you for your